I've got some PCB, some PCB both. He supplied those to me at no charge, I should specify that. This is my latest revision of the voltage divider project. It's my stickers and another pin as well. Thanks PCB way. I don't have to pay for these boards, which is great. It saves me a lot of money. And always very good quality. So these are enigged as well. Check out the clock. It's pretty cool, man. So this is the latest revision of the board. I can see it's all enigged, which is immersion gold. So all the exposed spots are covered in gold rather than solder. Hot air solder leveling, it's hassle, it's called. And yes, it's upside down, I know. But that's what the back looks like. I don't like this light. You can see this looks rather different to my previous boards where they were discrete resistors. Now, what I've got here on here instead is some precision resistors. So I'm using the USD V2 A10M 010 2. Hope you got that. And the other version is the 1776 681 or 6815, there's two versions. Unfortunately, I couldn't get the 5, I can't get the 681. The 6815 is slightly better specifications. That's the two alternative resistors we can use. I'm going to be building this up. I'm also going to change the op amp as well. So I can use either the ADA4077, the TR081, which is what I was using before, or the OP177FSZ. I haven't tried the ADA or the OP yet. I haven't tried those two yet. I've got the parts here. Now, in theory, the ADA4077 is the better part, probably. It's a latest revision of the part. It's basically the same series as the OP177, but it's a later generation, so it's actually spec as being slightly better, or specified as being slightly better than the OP177. But there's no offsets on that one. So the ADA4077 doesn't use this nulling on here, but the OP177 does. So I'm going to do the ADA4077 to see how well that goes. If I can't get the offsets correct or I have issues with that, then I'll swap that out and put in the OP177 instead. So because the ADA4077 has no tuning, it may not be precise enough. We'll see. In theory it should be, but don't know. Not until I try it. And the OP177 does allow trimming, just like the original TL081 does. And I can get that TL081 really close. Get it, you know, basically bang on really good position. So the OP177 is actually a much better part, so that should do even better if I need to. We'll look at that when we get to it. Yeah, so let's build this thing up. It should be pretty cool. I've also now got a built-in rotor driller here. Although I've said 78L05, I'm not going to be using that part. I'm going to be using something else, if I can remember what it is. I'm going to be using this instead. So it's a LD2981ABU50TR. It's got very similar specs, but it's a low dropout version, basically. So still 5 volt regular, 100 milliamps, same as the other one, same package, but it's a low dropout, which means you can use a lower voltage and still be stable. So we've got a few different things here, which we are trying out all at the same time. We've got different resistors, we've got different op amp, different board, different power supply, lots of variables from what were originally tried in the other version, which I've already built. I did a video on the original one. Well, the original versions, this is video number four, is it? I think it's number four. So in video three, I built a final version of that particular design, which is using discrete resistors and the TI-81 op amp. And that worked fine, it's a thousand to one divider, and it worked really well. But I thought, let's go a bit further. Those are using standard, well, fairly standard, fairly high precision, fairly good Temco resistors. They weren't right up there, but they're pretty good. They were fairly expensive parts. They were okay, and it did the job, but I thought, well, the next step is to go to a high precision resistor which is what these are. So, pop them in here. Oh. So these are the resistors. Uh, I need one of those. So this is the 1776. See that in there? That's the decade resistor, which is the one I prefer to use. And this one here is the USVD2 A10M, which is a 1001 fixed resistor value but it's actually two resistors back to back basically but you configure them as a 1001 ratio so that's a fixed 1001 so that's equivalent to what I've already got in the other module which I've already built what I'm actually going to do that's a 100 is it 120 dollar part that one that one resistor 120 bucks not cheap so I actually want to make a decade resistor at this time so that's what I'm actually going to build in this particular board is do a decade I think this does some like 10 100 1000 10,000 dividers something like that so that's why I built this board the way I have. I've got a header here, which allows me to, I could probably just do a, a fixed link, or I could make it switched. I could use a remote switch and switch through each resistance bank, and I could choose what divider ratio I actually want at the time. That could be pretty cool. I assume I did it right, of course. 
So the very last thing I put in will be this particular part. Because this, this isn't too expensive, it's $25 I think that was for this particular part. So price wise this was actually about the same as using the individual discrete resistors as I did in the previous revision. So cost wise it's about the same. Precision on this should actually be better. There's much more precise resistors, both of these. So this is actually very much like a part which is used in multimeters, for example. We use this part. I didn't order stencils of this because what I've already got will work. And plus I didn't have to worry about all those little individual resistors. So I put a put my new stencils actually onto it by hand. I'm not really too worried about it. Yeah, it's only a couple of parts, not a big deal, but when I had all those resistors on here, the stencil was quite important because it made it a lot easier. Right, let's get this thing soldered up. So what I'm gonna do is just flux it and use my soldering iron and put these parts on and um, we'll go from there so it's not going to be too dramatic but um, it should be pretty simple I don't actually have to put that much on this side so I'm going to use the op amp which doesn't require nulling on, on it so that's the ADA4077 which is supposed to be the latest generation op amp so at least of that series it's supposed to be better than the other one so that's the uh, that regulator so the OP177 which I've got here is not bad it should be better than what I've already used before but this one should be even better again so we'll give it a go alright let's get some solder on here see how we've already got some flux on bet you I should get my stretcher going there we go, that's much noisier <laughs> got some optional smoothing caps on here I'm going to leave those off, it didn't really seem to need it so I've got the voltage regulator here and the Pop amp. So I've got a drill gallet, I'll just sit that in there like that. And the op amp should drop on as well. well. Of course it went upside down. So now we use hot air on these. Get these ones in. This is going to get even noisier. Got a really low airflow. So it might take a little bit to get this melting. Yeah, so, it's on. so now I'm going to put in a capacitor just here. Now I've actually chosen a 330 nanofarad for this. So that can go there like that. And I will probably use hot air on that one as well actually. We're now stuck to the tweezers of course. So actually let's just get a bit more flux on here. Get something to stick to. That's that side of the board done. So we've got optional caps here and here. I did install them on the other versions. It didn't really seem to do much. It's just there for a bit of noise filtering. So if I do decide I can add them, I want to, you know, like one nanofarad is what I chose on those. Just really small value, just to help potentially reduce any noise. Probably not really necessary, but it's there if I need to. So now I need to install the componentry over here and on the back of the board over here. So I'll start off the IC, I think we'll do the same thing, flux it. In fact, I won't bother recording this, I'll just do it. You don't have to see the every bit of detail, you've seen what I'm doing. So I'm just going to flux it, solder it, drop the parts on, hot air it into place, and we'll be good. I'm just going to go and do that now instead of recording it all. You don't have to see every little detail. Right, so now I've got those parts all on. Now I'm putting these electricity capacitors on. These are quite important because these are needed for the... Um, negative rail supply here, help smoothen it out, so DC regulator here and the negative side under there is all needed for that. These are 25 volt caps and that's a 35 volt cap, plenty big enough for this. It's only potentially, you know, sort of plus or minus 6 volts, maybe at most. Input voltage most is 9 volts ish, so well within spec of these caps. Don't have to be too beefy. So I might as well solder these in. You can watch this one, it won't take me long. We can probably put the resistors in there now. So this is where I really need to decide which resistor I'm going to use because I can either do the 1000 to 1 ratio resistor or I can do the decade resistor which I think I'm going to go with. I mean I've already got a 1000 to 1 ratio unit as a prototype you know so I've already got one built 
obviously this is going to be like the next generation it's a little bit different I'll do the decade resistor and I've got all sorts of stuff to try out I mean I don't know if this is even going to work this op amp it may be not suitable I don't know I may need to use this offset trimming still which means I have to use the OP177 instead I don't know I'm going to find out obviously um, but right now I'll chuck the decade resistor in there we should be able to power that up and see what happens so the first challenge is yes it does actually fit I had to make my own footprint for these devices because there were no footprints for them so I had to make mine. Luckily it's standard spacing so I made it pretty easy to do. So at least that does actually fit. So all I've got to do, although the holes are a bit sloppy, is I'll just solder that in place. I have to figure out what I'm going to do about his header here. Whether I use jumper or a switch, I don't know yet. I might just use a jumper for the time being while I'm testing. But I do intend to have it switchable eventually. Right, I'm all set up here. Let's do some voltage tests, shall we? So I've got my power supply set up, I've got set to 7.5 volts, that's a nice nominal voltage for those batteries. I've got it hooked up to the input of this board, haven't tested anything yet. I've got the meter ready to go, DC, no AC because it speeds up the readings a little bit. So what I've got to do, if I remember rightly, I've got some wires on here I can poke the probes into to measure the voltages. There's at least one wire anyway. I think it's over there, yeah I think it's there and here. I think the ones I've got to do, which you can't quite see. Reference to the pad here for the binding post zero volt pad because that's the common ground which is used for it all so i should be able to measure five volts and minus five volts and we'll see how accurate this is and let's see how good this little dropout regulator is as well how accurate that is too and then we'll chuck some voltages into it and we'll see what comes out as well and see how this is going for offset yeah if the power supply is perfectly balanced it might not be an issue but if it is slightly off one way or the other i don't know if it affects it or not but I guess we'll find out, I suppose. Right, let's turn this thing on, see if we get any smoke. Okay, car's looking good, zero. That's always a good sign. Let's measure voltages relative to this. So that's the zero volt there. Uh, we've got five volts will be coming out here. Oh, look at that, 5.007, that's pretty good. And that should be over here somewhere too. Is it over there? I think it's that wire. Is it? No. That one? No. This one? No, go over here. 4.979, so not 4.98 basically. And there's 5 volts over there, so cool. So it's slightly offset in a positive fashion on the power supplies, but we're getting a nice power supply there. So what I'll try now is dropping this voltage down, see what we get on this supply rail, and see how it handles it. Um, we'll chuck it on the 5 volt rail first. I think this is an LDO, so it should do quite well. Yeah, right down to 5 volts basically, 5.1, 5 volts it starts dropping. So 5.1 volts in, and yeah, that's good. So let's just go do exactly the same from the negative supply. And I've got the probes back to front, haven't I? Yeah, the other one I just did was a positive supply, not a negative supply. Probes in there, the right way around. Do it again. That's staying pretty linear, that's good. That's not changing, it's down to 6 volts, which is as large as it's ever going to go. 4.98 still. That's looking good, right down to 5 volts. Yep, that's rock solid. That's excellent. So that's exactly what it should be doing. The input voltage isn't influencing the upper voltages at all. So that's perfect. Okay, next test. I haven't tried this myself yet. I've, I've fitted in a, um, a JST header over here. And I've got a jumper cable ready here to use. I've got a shorting plug on the output terminal right now. There's no power going to it, so it won't matter. Just making sure my meter is zeroed correctly, which it is. You can see power is not currently on. So what we should do now is move the jumper into the input side. Short that side out as well. You can see picking up some stray noise. Right, let's turn the power supply on. One millivolt, okay. So it's probably just random noise that's around the place Let's straight to that one yeah, one millivolt ish negative one millivolt let's go to this next one over here that's doing even better okay could just be a bit of strange noise around here can we get on to the next pin if I can't that's even better so the greater the divider ratio the better that's actually looking so it's not too bad, but it's also kind of what you expect as well. So if I do, that should be 
100 to 1, I think. Or 1,000 to 1. I can't believe which ratio it is now. That's looking alright. I think I can live with that. Ish. We'll see. So once I start calibrating, we'll see what happens. Um, okay, so let's unplug this. Now I've got the PDV S2 Mini sitting over here. As you can see, it's not powered up yet. We'll turn this on. This is obviously going to warm up as well, so it's not going to be stable to start off with. Just plug the jumper back in again. And let's do the lowest ratio here. And we'll chuck one volt in. One volt's given basically 100 millivolts. It's still settling, obviously. You can see it's creeping up. But it looks promising. So that's obviously the 10 to 1 ratio, is that one? We'll see what it settles down to. I'll come back in a minute. Well, I've set it at 5 volts now, and this is what we're getting out. It's 5 point, well, 5 millivolts, 0 0.32 ish. Um, that's actually stabilised. Go back to 1 volt again. 5 and of, um, well, 5 volts is the most I can do on the millivolt range on this meter. And you can see it at 100.28 there. So it is slightly skewed which is bothering me a little bit. So if we go back to zero volts and there's the offset just there. Is it this meter which is slightly off? Possibly. Um, I haven't actually checked the calibration accuracy of this to be honest. I should do that. But it's going to be pretty close. I could always plug it straight into here. Actually if I go straight in, let's check it this way shall we? 500 millivolts, 500 .11. So yeah, this is very slightly off, but right now it's actually, you see it's 28 degrees in here, it's a bit too hot. I'm too hot, certainly. So I think everything's too hot. <laughs> so yeah, um, okay, 100 millivolts. And that's almost bang on there actually. Yeah, so the slight error on the meter is also something to consider. All right, so it's not perfect. So let's, um, Look at just doing this jumper differently and doing a different ratio and higher input voltage and see if it helps it. Um, so if I do 10 volts I'll get 100 millivolts out of this board and the next go over. So I should be getting that reading there, 100.01. Let's try and get that shall we? Okay, it's all hooked up. Set zero volts right now. Um, oh, let's do one volt scale. So one is given 10 millivolts, that's good. Five is given 50, it's slightly high. And 10 is giving 100.00, well, 04, so 05. So it is very slightly skewed, which is very slightly annoying. So I put on the next range over now. So 10 volts in is 10 millivolts out. So that's the 1001 ratio. And that's actually looking pretty good though. Let's get in one volt. My millivolt, so that's actually looking pretty good. The 1000 one is looking pretty accurate, um, at least as far as this meter is concerned. I'll need to use this on a better meter. This is the 10,000 one. Put it back up 10 volts, and we get my millivolt. So, yeah, those are good. So, what can I do about trimming this thing? This op amp doesn't have trimming. I need to think about this. So I'm injecting one millivolt right now in the 10 to 1 ratio setting. And we're getting 0.35 out. If we go to zero, it will drip down. So there is that very slight offset here. It's a bit annoying. That offset is changing depending on where I have this jumper set on this connector here. And also, me being near it also changes it. So could this be ambient noise which is causing this? Just pipe my hand near it. Shifts it in the opposite direction. Maybe it's nothing. I mean, if I try twisting them and doing something, is that changing anything? It's not twist, is it? Let's just do it. Yeah. I don't know. It could just be ambient noise getting in here and affecting that reading. I mean, it's perfect right now. So put one volt on this. 10 millivolts, that's bang on. 5, so in 50. 10 volts, 100.03. Pretty close. So maybe it's just ambient noise getting into it. I mean, if I put my hand near it, that's dropping down. 
Yeah, maybe it doesn't need trimming. Maybe it is just noise. Once I've got it inside the case, it might be fine. Okay, that's good. I'm a bit happy about that now. I think we're okay. It works. 10 volts in, 10 millivolts out. Sweet. I reckon that's pretty good. So if I put 1,000 volts in, should get 1 volt out. The idea of having the multiple ranges on here is that you can use it on different ranges on your multimeter. So if you've got a multimeter which is calibrated really well on a certain range, and you know it's really good on that particular range, you can make sure this is divided down to the ratio which will work within that range on your multimeter so you get the most accurate performance possible. That's good. 10 volts in, 10 millivolts out. I need to put this in a box. If that had arrived yet. Right, so I've drilled out through the panel here for the box. I've got a different box this time. This one's slightly bigger than the one I used before. Just to make my job a little bit easier. Same kind of deal though, split case. A bit easier to work with. And this I'm pretty confident is going to be okay. I just need to get the thing into a box, I think, and get it all mounted up nicely, I suppose, and shielded properly to get rid of the noise. So I've got these binding posts which Pomona provided to me at no cost. These are another sponsorship thing, just like the PCBs, which came from PCBWay. I've got a full set here, so I already had one full set I used for the previous version, so I've got enough here to do one more. I just need to mount these on. So I've actually, when I did this last, I made them quite a tight fit, they kind of popped in. What I've done this time, I've just made my life a little bit easier and I've just given them a bit of a, a clearance seal there. So these were these are 8mm mounting holes and I made these 8.5mm just to make it a bit easier to put together. Because, you know, it doesn't really need to be that precise, honestly. Alright, so I've started mounting these up. I'll just poke them through right now. I've got to put these little spacer pieces on the back of them all. So I to make sure I put the board in order up. Goes around like that. Now I did this one before, I actually found that these washers that are on these are actually a little bit big. They actually, at least for this particular application, the binding post plane on here is actually slightly smaller than these washers. So I didn't end up installing them. I ended up taking it back off again when I did it last time. So let's get some nuts on these before it falls apart again and I mess it up. So I've got some bunch of spare parts left over now because um, some of these came with two nuts, some only came with one. I don't know why there's a difference. I'm not quite sure what you're actually supposed to get with these, but uh, one's fine, that's all I actually need is one. So I'm coming along with this, I've got the box built into there, I've got the front panel basically built. I've got to just figure out the interconnects now between the battery, the BMS, um, also the power cables into this board here, and how I'm going to do this, because really I kind of need like a, a negative common for everything, but I don't actually have a bus, I suppose, negative bus, I don't really have one. So I need to hook all that stuff up, but I'm basically there, I'm, I'm coming along. So the switch is on, so this is a multi-way switch, so that's a four position switch. This allows me to use all the options from the resistor, which is 10, 100, 1000, 10,000. I also play with the idea of making this switch the on-off switch as well. So it'd be off and then like 1110. Um, that's what I had played with the idea of, because it is a three pole switch. Then he decided not to do that. I thought I'll just go, I'll stick with a toggle switch and just um, keep that a bit simple. And that way, I'll get all four divider ranges on, on this switch here. And it gives me those options. I'm going to set it once and hopefully just use it in that position. I will have to obviously be careful about what setting this is in when I do go to use it because if it's in the divide by 10 range and I shove a thousand volts into it, it's going to be shoving a hundred volts into the op amp. I think that'd be bad. All right, so I've made a bit more progress. I've started wiring up the switch on the back here. So what I've decided to do is use two poles of the switch in parallel in order to reduce switch resistance. It shouldn't really be an issue anyway because we've got such small levels of resistance. It shouldn't really matter. But for the sake of why not, let's just do it. So I've paralleled up two of the switch banks, right? So it's a four position switch. So I've got three poles on the switch. I'm using two poles in parallel. And that's what I've just done. Hooked all those up in parallel. So I've got pin 1 goes to pin 5, pin 2 goes to pin 6, and so on. Obviously I've left one pole here unpopulated. Obviously I've done this on purpose. I've done that in case I ever need to use that for anything else. Maybe I'll do something, maybe an indicator or something later on to warn me if I'm on a certain range. I've got a spare pole to do that if I decide to do something different later on. I've still got to do the ribbon cable goes from this to the switch. I've got to solder the wires on individually. It's only five wires, not a big deal, but they come from here to the switch, so it's going to be quite short. Now I've actually allowed quite a lot of wire on the power supply side, so I can actually take the front panel off. So I, I kind of need to do the same thing for this, but 
the shorter those are, the better, because there's less noise is going to get induced into the system. So it's a bit of a trade-off between usability for if I need to take the thing apart, or if I want to ensure there's no noise, if there were some. Um, so I think I'm probably going to actually keep this quite short. I have a little bit on there, so I can get the casings off. But if I need to take this thing apart, this will just fold down, because these wires are all soldered. But I can unplug this wire. Now I did actually realise I made a small mistake when I did this connector here. If you look closely, you might be able to see something with a footprint in it. Yeah, it's upside down. <laughs> the, the socket's supposed to be around the other way, so pin one is the common, and all the other pins are the switching. So I've actually I have to allow for that when I build it. It's not a big deal. It's just the way my head works. Pin one is going to be the common, but now pin five is going to be the common instead. Not a big deal. Right, just about the moment of truth. I've got the wiring done. I don't think I've forgotten anything. BMS is over here. I'm going to also hot glue this in as well. I don't like to rely on the double-sided tape. Um, the same for this, for the voltage regulator over here, which is putting out 9 volts for the charging circuitry. I'm going to do something with those. I'm going to hot glue those as well, just so it's not just only relying on double-sided tape. I like to have a secondary securement system. So what I've done over here for this JST connector. So I've actually split the wires apart to try and increase separation between them. Because I was thinking if I've got a ribbon and I've got high voltage through one wire and the next wire and the next wire, they're going to add noise in. And I thought, well, if I twist them, is that going to induce more noise? It probably will. Because you're not talking about a pair of wires. You know, it's not like a current pair. You know, positive, negative. We twisting them will actually help get rid of noise, like I've done with these other ones here. If you twist these ones, they might actually induce more noise. Having ribbons might be alright, but I thought if I separate them, it increases the distance between the wires and reduces potential noise pickup as well. So I haven't tested this yet, nothing's been tested. I've put the batteries in, not powered up yet, so I won't actually get power it. So there's no power yet. Um, once I put power for the first time, it should come alive and we'll see what happens. So I'm just about ready to try it. Nervous moments. These batteries aren't actually a pair. This one's a 3000 mAh, this one's a 2600 mAh. They're not actually a pair. Is it going to matter? Probably not. I'm never really playing on fully discharging this thing. Anyway, let's see if I've got power from the batteries themselves onto the BMS. Let's see if I've got that much. Yep, 8.3 volts across here, so they're both fully charged as well. Um, that's good. So that's looking fine. I should check the middle battery point, make sure I've got connections to both ends of the batteries. 4.1, 4.1, yep, that's all good. So this part's ready to go. I should just be able to put power on and enable the charge circuit, measure the charging voltage, make sure that looks okay down here at the charging point on here. And it should then actually power up once I've got power plugged in, so let's try it. I have a cable here ready to go. Plug that in. First things first, check the voltages to make sure nothing's going horribly wrong. 8.46 volts showing up on the end of there. So that means I should have 9 volts or so up here relative to the negative. 9 volts, we do. So that's looking good there. That's, that's at the output of the regulator. But I've got some going through a shocky diode. It drops it down a bit. And you're going to get slightly more voltage drop as the current is also there as well. So that's looking fine. So these batteries should be looking alright there. 8.46 showing up on, across both batteries. So individual cells. It's 4.19 and climbing very slowly. And obviously backwards. 4.22, that's looking a little bit on the higher side, but, but I know these BMSs do work actually okay, so I'm not too worried about that. I'll, I'll probably will fully charge it and monitor it and make sure it goes okay. But now it's powered up, should we unplug the power again, and we should now be able to turn this thing on. And we do, we have a light. So that's good. At least the BMS is definitely working. So let's pop the cover together. This is far larger than my previous one now. I've got these bolts sticking out the bottom here. I've got to do something with these. I've got to put some feet on the bottom. Obviously, I haven't done that yet. But I just want to put some input and check the output and see what comes out. So we've got my PDVS2 Mini sitting here. Not been powered up yet, so we'll see how that goes. Let's get the cable. Let's turn this on. Input is that side. I need to label this, obviously. All right, so we've got 10 volts going in. One volt coming out. That's it, divide by 10, or 10 to 1 ratio, to 100 to 1 ratio, 1000 to 1 ratio. Let's just do this. 
not more digits. And 10,001 ratio. So yeah, it is working. And half a volt, 500 coming out, yeah, 2 volts, 20 coming out, 20, 2, 0.2-ish. So yeah, that's working. Right, here we go. It is now all built, all labelled up. I'm happy with that. It uh, seems to be fine. What I need to do next is to hook this up to my test gear and actually check the accuracy because you know I need to actually work out how precise this really is. I mean it's supposed to be precision, in theory it's precision. I mean I've done it on this other meter over here and that seemed close. But I need to put it on a better meter. So I've got my test gear warming up, it's been on for about half an hour now I think. I've got a few multimeters running, I've got my HP uh, 3457A, I've got the Datron 1062 and the Solitron 7975 all warming up as well as my Fluke 343A DC calibrator and my Valhalla 2703 AC calibrator because this will actually handle AC as well. Surprise, surprise. Right, so I'm all hooked up here. I've got uh, 200 volts going in for my DC calibrator down here. The Solotron is monitoring that voltage. You can see what the exact voltage is coming out here. Um, I could have another digit on, but I'm not going to bother. That's fine. Accurate enough. And I'm going through here with a 100 to 1 divider ratio. This is what's coming up on the Datron. And this is what's coming up on the HP. Hoping to see the HP one okay. It's a bit small. So they're basically agreeing. This thing, see there's a bit of an error here though. 200.01, 200.002. So it's all the magnitude out, I suppose. I suppose you could say that. That's at 200 volts. If I go down to say 20 volts instead, You can see you've got the same kind of error on there as well. Let's have a bit of settling time. We'll have a bit of settling time, but we'll get there. If I go down to the 10 to 1 ratio, and get up to 2 volts again. In this range, it's actually pretty accurate. In 10 to 1, it's pretty close. What I've actually found is, that, although I've said 50 to 1, 500 to 1, oh sorry, 500, 50 volts or 500 volts on there, I was assuming that I could get closer to the rail, and the rail was actually a lot further away. So I won't actually respond to right up close to the rail. And so I actually checked. So, but I can check this now. So, because I'm in this particular range, I'm going up to 50 volts. I'll do 30 volts. That's fine. 40 volts is basically topping out. So, you see it's topping at 3.7 volts, so that's the maximum input voltage I can put onto the op amp because otherwise it won't actually achieve the voltage output. I'm going to have to keep the limit probably of say 30 volts input. Obviously because it's being converted 10 to 1, so 30 volts in with 3 volts into the op amp. Well, in this case 3.7 volts into the op amp, effectively. What you're getting coming out is what's going in because it's one to one voltage follower, isn't it? So that's fine. Let's so go down 10 volts. And here we're getting some error creeping in. You know, it's not really meant for these lower voltages anyway, it's meant for higher voltage stuff. But obviously I'll allow for that. But um, this is the thing with not having a calibratable op amp system. So this is obviously fixed, there's no calibrations on it. So what I get is what I get, which is the trade-off. So I may actually change the op amp and put the offset adjustable one in there instead. Although this one's supposed to be better than that op amp. Um, that may give me the calibration points I need to just trim it and get it a little bit closer. But it's not too far off really. So if I try going up a bit higher, now my calibrator here has got a problem with 300 volt range. I need to get around to fixing this actually. It doesn't work properly between 300 and 399 on that particular range. I'll do 400 volts though. It'll be fine. Change the range on that so it can work. As you can see, 400.003, 400.06, 400 400.07. So these two are within like five counts of each other, which is what I expect. And uh, so the Solitron's saying it's that much coming out of the calibrator. So what I might do now is put the Solitron up to this and I shall prove that these readings kind of match. Just in case you're doubting the accuracy of the Solitron as well with its offsetting things. There you go. Turn the calibrator on. 
and you'll see this is agreeing as well within five counts. Basically, Cybertron is exactly the same as the HP. Almost exactly, a lot without a count or two. So, and you can see this is really good. So, yeah, I mean, all within like five or six counts at that particular voltage, which is good. So, if we go, say, 700 volts. So it's drifting off very slightly there. So I should really work with that, shouldn't I? I really stop doing maths on my head and I'm recording video because I always get it wrong. <laughs> you go, it's 800 volts. Now I think my calibrator here gets a bit flaky around 1000 volts. It does seem to be a bit erratic. You can see it's jumping around a little bit there. So I think it's not particularly happy about 800 volts. That's something I need to look at at some point. Even though I've already recapped the whole thing. So 900 volts is slightly more stable. And you can see they're basically agreeing that those two are exactly the same, that's four counts out relative to those. So you can say that the output voltage is right, at least agreed, um, with 900 volts going in. Getting 146 here. So let's shove the uh, Solotron directly onto the output there and we'll see exactly what we're getting. So you can see that we're actually out by you know, 140 millivolts there, 142 millivolts or so. Yeah, I don't know. It's not too bad, I suppose. But uh, I was hoping for better than that. So I just swapped out for my other one, the first one I built, 1001 fixed division ratio, which I did with discrete resistors and stuff like that. I've obviously seen all that in video. You should have seen it in the video. I've done videos on it. So let's do 900 volts again with this unit instead. How accurate is this one? Because this one was calibrated. I've only just turned it on. So you can see this was actually looking only slightly worse. But drifting, so I just turned it on. So it's all warming up. But yeah. Considering that the parts in this are cheaper than the parts in that, it's not bad, is it? So you can build yourself something reasonable compared to that but that is drifting like I said. So let's drop this voltage down a bit go down to say 500. Here over there is a bit worse. 200. There is some settling time to calibrate as well so you know, I'm not really allowed for that but you can see what the voltage here is. As well as these meters it's all got a bit of settling time so you can see the error on this is actually worse than this but it's not bad really. Is that 0.1%? I think it is. So one of the things that's better about this one than this as well is that you can't blow this up because being a 1000 volt fixed ratio, so 1001 volt fixed ratio, you're not going to exceed that voltage unless you happen to be particularly unlucky. You know, 1000 volts in. You know, you need to put 3000 volts in in order to blow your amp in this thing. Well, maybe 4000 volts, and you're not going to get anywhere near that. So, generally, anyway, most people wouldn't be going there. Whereas this, you have to be much more careful because you make sure you've got a switch, quick switch position because. If I put this in the last switch position and I put in a high voltage, well the inputs to the op amp can be quite high and it won't like that. It may destroy it, it may handle it, it may actually internally clamp, I don't know. It may have protections built in. I'm not going to try to find out, at least not on purpose. One day I'm sure I'll do it, but uh, <laughs> I, uh, I still got heaps of spares as well. Let's check back on again. So that's back on this one again in the 1001 ratio. And you can see the accuracy on this is definitely you know, 10 to 1 better. Order magnitude better, as Dave likes to say. Now if we go to 10,000 to 1 ratio, I haven't shown you that one yet. And that's what we're getting out there. Which is actually more accurate at 10,000 to 1. At least in this case. At least it is on here. Maybe not on this one. A bit noisy. I don't have this whole guarding thing, if I change the guard switch it may change things a little bit yeah I mean yeah it can do depends what you're doing so that's 200 volts in, 20 millivolts out if I go up to uh, 700 volts and here you can see my calibrate is being a little bit twitchy you know, I've got something going on with my calibrator here. It's quite annoying because I know I refurbished this a few years ago. 
did a video on it. So at that point there, it's you know out a little bit, but 10,000 to 1 ratio, 60 millivolts for 600 volts in. I think that's not too bad. So now I'm back down to 10 volts on the calibrator there. I'll do the AC one in a minute. We'll check that one out. You can see on here, 10 volts coming out, and we're getting just under 1 millivolt there. That's 10,000 to 1. Okay, 1,000 to 1. 10 millivolts. So 1,000 to 1 basically give you the you know, direct reading, 1 millivolts to volts conversion, which is better. This is jumping around a little bit, this one. It's interesting. Let's go 100 to 1. And 10 to 1. That's going to be 1 volt. Alright, so now I've got the AC calibrator hooked up, and this, the output of this isn't very accurate. It, it's a bit, I don't know, I think it needs some work, I think. This one I've repaired previously as well, and I don't completely trust it. I would like a better calibrator. I've been keeping my eye out for a Datron actually, but uh, the price has been a bit high. Cytotron reads accurately, well, pretty accurately. I can prove that in a second. If I plug this into the same as these, they give basically the same readings anyway, you know, within reason. They're all pretty accurate relative to each other. So I've got 10 volts going in right now at 500 hertz, and you can see the error here. Um, I think with AC, you know, you get more error to frequency as effects. Now let's go down to 100 hertz, and you see it gets a little bit closer. Frequency is a little bit less of an issue there. Go up to uh, 1 kilohertz. Error gets a bit worse. 5 kilohertz, which I can now hear, you can probably hear too, and you see it drops right off. Now I'm pretty sure when I did the same test on the other unit over there, the drop off wasn't quite so bad. Let me hook that one up. So now I'm hooked into the original one, which is using the TL081 op amp, and you can see that at the same frequency, it's a lot better. Curious. So let's go to 50 kilohertz, how's it handle it? Now it's dropping off quite a bit. So let's bring it down, you know, 10 kilohertz. Obviously this is a different scaling because it's 1001, not uh, 10 to 1, so that may have an influence as well. I'll drop the other one to, to 1001 in a minute as well. But here you go, 10 kilohertz, it's dropping off a little bit. I mean, it's, the op amp itself is rated for uh, 3 megahertz or something like that, that's in that other unit there. So I think this is only 1.5 megahertz, something like that. So it's not the op amp itself, it's obviously the associated circuitry creating an inductance which is causing problems. And here it's reading high at 100 hertz. 10 hertz is going to be interesting. Let's see how it handles that. Let's jump around a bit on this one. 50 hertz is looking, yeah, there we go, 50 hertz is where it kind of wants to be at the bottom end. That's what it looks like. So, yes, frequency wise. It's interesting the way it changes by so much. So on this one here, it's up the voltage bit. I'm only using 10 volts. Let's go 100 volts. Now this can only handle 750 volts AC, so I have to make sure I don't exceed that definitely. The electron can handle 1000 volts. This can only handle 300. So I'm putting in 99.995, and I'm getting out 100 at this frequency, 5 hertz. It's got 10 kilohertz, which is going to be 5 kilohertz on here and that's still okay, and that's on that 1001 ratio unit. And the HP is really 98.4, which is somewhat interesting, but uh, yeah, I found the, AC, the HP doesn't work so well on the AC ranges. It seems to be much less consistent than what I've been seeing. Anyway, well, I'll swap back to the other one. So what I've done now is i put this onto 1001 ratio, so it's direct comparison with the other unit. Put this back up to 100 volts. I dropped it down while I was handling things. And now we're getting better accuracy, it's very much the same as the first unit. So that's interesting, isn't it? You know, it's still off, you know, it's 100 volts, it's at half a percent, 0.5 percent off, at least on here. This one's 1.8 percent off downwards, but that's probably the meter itself. I don't trust it completely, even though it's supposed to be calibrated before I bought it. AC seems a bit wacky, as I said. So that's a 5 kilohertz. Let's do 50 kilohertz, how's it handle that? reads higher yeah and that's reading slightly higher too so the higher um, div divisor ratio makes this perform better so let's go down to 500 hertz again and that's looking alright on both of those meters actually 500 hertz is looking a bit more accurate 
Uh, yeah, that's okay. Should we go higher? I think we should. So let's drop down to say 300 on here. Yep, that should be good. Yep. So we'll turn off. So now there's 300 volts out. Thereabouts, accuracy of this, like I said, is not great. I do want a better calibrator. So 209.37 coming out, 300.1, 300.05 at 500 hertz. That's not looking too bad. 50 hertz. Yeah, okay. Now it won't let me do any more than one kilohertz on this particular voltage output. Another reason I prefer to get a different calibrator. But at least it's a calibrator I can actually exceed 100 volts on. My flute can do high frequency, but I can't get more than 100. 20 volts I think it is. That's looking right there. Let's pump the voltage up a bit more. It's 500 volts. Yep, that's looking okay. 700, which is approaching the maximum of this thing, so I don't want to go any more than that. And 700.4. So that's 699.4. That seems to be working okay. Let's go down to 10,001 and see how that looks. That's saying 71 millivolts, saying 69. So obviously the accuracy of the meters as well also plays a bit of a part with frequency and stuff like that as well. 200 hertz. And yeah, doing 70, 70.1. Well, it's working anyway. I mean, trying to characterize this would be interesting. I kind of need to get GPIB going and that sort of stuff. And as I don't have a properly calibrated meter, I mean, this is supposed to be calibrated, but I don't trust it. I believe it's been truly calibrated correctly. Yeah, don't really trust it. The Datron seems more consistent, to be honest. This is the one I repaired before the video on this, you haven't seen it already. This is this performs better generally than the HP does. It seems more consistent, it's got a flat of responses, things things like that. Which is surprising. But uh, it does seem to work slightly better than the HP. Thumbs up if you like the video. This has been a pretty cool thing to make. Maybe give you some ideas to something you can make yourself. Subscribe if you're not already subscribed. Thumbs up if you like the video, as I already said. If you're interested, become a Patreon, help support me to buy things and make bits and pieces, buy bits of test gear to fix, then please become a Patreon. There's links down below for that as well. This I purchased as a working unit. This I purchased as broken fixed. This I purchased as broken fixed. This I purchased as broken fixed. That I purchased as broken fixed. And I'm going to get down there. That I purchased broken fixes as a fluke. This isn't a calibrator, which you can't really see. You probably will see sick now too. All right, catch you later. Thanks for watching. I don't think I forgot anything. It works. Yay. <laughs>